You know, we have pulled together the best judges panel ever. Let's welcome them. Let's see. SC, did you watch her keynote this afternoon? Yes. Misty. How many of you know Misty? Yeah, yeah, please. Angela is CEO in waiting at Dexcom. Maybe you want to spread out. <laughs> um, yes, Susan. Do you guys? How many? Yes. Um, how many of you have a Beats headset? A few of you. Susan was the first CEO of Beats. We are lucky to have her. Zamir. You know, Misty runs Techstars. Zamir has run 100 accelerators. So give, give Zamir a big hand. 42. 42. 42. I rounded it. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Anand. So I worked for Anand for 20 years at Intel, a few years at Qualcomm. So everything I know about business, I learned from Anand. Please give him a big hand. And I went to school with Chetan a few years ago. We won't talk about when. OK, so the biggest challenge we have in this session is to stay on time. Um, so what we are going to do is we have seven startups. We'll go clockwise. So we'll start with Pradnya, then go to Brad, and so on and so forth. Each startup will have four minutes to present. Um, I'm normally nice, but today I cannot be nice. Um, so if somebody runs over four minutes, we have to cut you off. Is that OK? OK. Um, then the judges will have six minutes of Q&A. Um, they are supposed to ask really tough questions of the founders. And then one minute of switch over. When they are switching over, we will do an audience poll. So I have this AI device. It takes pictures and counts how many of you are standing up, right? So after every, after every startup pitch, I'll ask you to stand up if you support the founder. We'll take a picture. Then after the seven pitches, whoever had the most standing people will win the People's Choice Award. OK. We'll start with Pradnya, founder and CEO of Advocate. She's coming here from Seattle. Let's give her a big hand. Hello, everyone. I'm Pradnya Desh, the CEO of Advocat. I'm a lawyer and a former diplomat of the United States. Advocat is your very own AI legal team. It's faster, cheaper, and safer legal. Startups and small companies have a problem. They pay very high attorney's fees, almost 933K by Series C. They also have no single source of truth that are, is monitoring all of their legal needs. They have their contracts scatters, scattered everywhere, Google, Google Docs, Carta, SharePoint, DocuSign. And there's nothing that's really reading all of those documents at all times, monitoring those, those obligations, and seeing what you should do when. So instead, founders and small businesses spend hours internally adjusting NDAs, SLAs, sales agreements, vendor agreements, employment agreements, but they still make bet the company expensive mistakes. I saw it time and time again in my law practice. So what's the solution? 
It's Advocat. It's contract lifecycle management with AI agents. There are four parts to it. There's first, you can generate any contract on Advocat. A, a person can negotiate um, as well as get a contract reviewed on Advocat. They can get legal answers and then they can monitor it all. It use, it's the very first AI legal team for SMBs and startups. It uses generative AI as well as our own patented uh, processes for a secure knowledge graph that's trained on company data as well as law, legal best practices, and um, statutes and cases. The market is huge. Let's see if I can make that, there we go. The market is really huge. Um, the SMB market is $23.3 billion and the startup market is $77 million of that. Even though the startup market is a smaller portion of it, we found that it's a really good beachhead to get into the same company size. And we have traction in both. This is what the competitive landscape looks like. CLM stands for Contract Lifecycle Management. So contract lifecycle management uh, is um, mostly for large enterprise. So the category um, for CLM is um, focused on attorneys and it ignores very small companies. Um, so um, this is a very crowded market. The CLM market is very crowded. There are about 150 players that are just focused on large enterprise. Um, another category is um, law firm AI. So law firm AI, again, is only for attorneys. It's not for startups and SMBs. Um, and in both of these, it takes months to get onboarded onto a system, and that's also a very crowded market. We, on the other hand, have found a portion of the legal tech market that's not crowded at all. We're focused on SMBs, so a full solution um, for SMBs that uses AI agents. So it's an AI legal team, really for everybody else, not just for attorneys. We, um, this is our go-to-market. The way that we have reached these customers is that this is, so this is our pricing, um, that also the way that we've reached these customers are, th are through two different strategies. We have a product-led growth strategy for the startup market, and mainly because startups are really easy to find, really easy to get to, and they buy really quickly. And so we use uh, partnerships with startups, accelerators, as well as organic marketing and content, and through the strategy, we're gaining around five new customers per day on that strategy. We we also have a reseller strategy. And so the way that we do that is we are a Microsoft cloud partner on the marketplace and with a transactable offer. We have signed up for resellers and the resellers sign us up about, um, they, they sell um, $5,000 subscriptions um, per, uh, per, um, per customer. And so we have four resellers. Oh. Okay, our traction, we have about 200 companies on the marketplace, and we will be at 106 million by the, um, by uh, 106 million by 2029. Oh, it didn't, uh, there we go. I don't know how to make it go forward, there we go. Um, that's the traction roadmap. Our team has done this before with multiple successful exits, including an exit to Microsoft AI. Um, and this is what we're raising. We're raising $3 million. Um, we are backed already by Morgan Stanley, Masters Fund, Spark Growth Ventures, and Gangels. Thank you. Uh, OK, who has questions for Pradnya? OK, uh, let's start with Essie. So great presentation, thank you. The first question I have, and I'll stick to one. Uh, what is your exit strategy? So we do know that every company uh, needs legal. And so we know that this company can be really big. So we plan, so, oh, uh, one other thing is a few months ago, two of the largest CLMs for the enterprise space uh, approached us to acquire us. We said no, because we, we aren't ready to do that. We're, we, we would like to, to um, take the company public. Uh, Zamin. So two questions. Uh, first of all, have you built your own LLM or are you using a third party? Second. Zamin, can, can, can we stay with one so we, we can have as many questions? Let, sure. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we use, um, so we do not, we've not built our own LLM and that's, um, actually I'd love to talk to you more about that. It's because when you benchmark a fine-tuned model, it is not as good for legal when you use a large foundational model. So we use GPT-4 Turbo, we use GPT-4 Omni, we use Cloud 3 Opus as well as for, for certain parts of it, we use Gemini as well. We also have a legal knowledge graph, not, so not only an LLM, we have the knowledge within a legal knowledge graph. Misty. What does that three million get you in terms of milestones? 
Yeah, so first it gets us, we, we need to hire a lot more engineers and three growth people. Um, and by then, we by the end of the year, um, we will have um, gotten 20 resellers. So it gets us to 20 resellers, as well as 1.2 million in ARR by the end of the year, and 3.6 million by the end of next year. So we won't need any more funding to, to get to either of those milestones after that. Um, and then um, to, um, at the end of 2025, to hire an enterprise sales so those are those are what we're doing with, with the money. Anand, you had Um It sounds like there's a consultative uh, selling process here. Is that correct, or am I misunderstanding? Well, with the product-led growth strategy, um, actually, no. You can just go to the website right now, and you should, um, and buy Advocat, and you get a 14-day free, free trial. What's your retention rate? Um, so we launched this product on market in January, and we've so far had zero churn. So. Everybody who started Advocate is still a customer. Anand, I, um, <laughs> let, let's hold. Uh, Anand, uh, did you, were you no, finished with your question? Okay. Z Zamir, you had another question. Uh, the training data, I'm just interested. What, what do you use to train the algorithms? Yeah, so we trained the knowledge graph and, of course, didn't train the LLM because we didn't fine-tune it. We trained it using a set of checklists. It originally came from my law firm, actually, is that we trained it on a set of checklists, and then we've updated it with statutes, best practices, um, and cases that come out, so we, we keep it current. So we, And then the other thing, of course, that we train it on is company data itself. The company data stays within the knowledge graph layer, and it doesn't go down into the knowledge graph layer. I mean, sorry, the LLM layer. Can you share the terms of this raise as well as the acquisition offers? Like, what were the range of acquisition price that you received? Okay. Um, I have not publicly talked about the, about the pricing on the acquisition offer, but I, I mean, I might as well now because we said no. So, the terms of the raise is that it's a safe. Um, we don't yet have our first term sheet, which means we're going to be reasonable and hear what the valuation we're presented with. Um, I do know that one VC said that they're going to give us a term sheet on Tuesday, but we don't know. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens, um, and that will set the valuation. Tanya, um, yeah. your last raise. Yeah. Um, how much did you raise, and what was the valuation? Yeah, we raised $1.8 million. The round that Morgan Stanley came in, we raised $1.8 million at a $5 million cap. But that was back before we had written a single line of code and didn't really anything at all. Times are different now. How many and people in the team? Pardon? How many people in the team? Oh, so we ha um, it's actually a really small team. We've achieved all of this with four people. Four people so far? Yeah. The raise, how much will you be? With, with the raise, we're going to hire three new engineers and three new, three new growth people, so we're going to add seven people to the team. Um, eh, um, Pradnya, SC had a question on m &A if you want to answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Might have avoided that question. Um, so um, the, the two of two of our competitors made an acquisition. I wouldn't say offer. We started discussions and we told that we're not that we weren't interested. But they were talking at the twenty million dollar range at that time, and that was October ish. Okay, we have one or two time for one or two more questions. Yes, Mr. How long did it take you to get to the two hundred customers, and what was that month over month growth? Yeah, so this, this product we launched on market in January. Uh, so between January and now is how long um, it took us. Um, the, in January, mostly who was with us were, customer, were beta customers, actually. Um, so January, February, it was pretty close. And then we started marketing. Um, on, we started doing just Google Ads um, in March. And that's when we, we, we started taking off. And right now, um, we're at five new, new company customers today. Today, I know that's not a complete answer because it was a little. Uh, we know what we did over five months, and we know what we've done recently. But uh, it had fits and starts between March and now. But Pradnya, we, we'll wrap with that. Um, give a big hand to Pradnya. Thank you. Okay, so while the judges are tabulating, let's go to zero two, um, and we will do a quick voting. So if you, if you want her to win, it doesn't matter one, two, or three, please stand up and I'll take a picture. We'll, we'll put AI to work. Okay, this device sees what I see. So if I can see you, the device can see you. Okay, I heard click. Thank you, everyone. So next up is Brad.
Um, he comes from sunny San Diego, and he'll talk about IPOP AI. All right, everybody, it's great to be here. Great to get to introduce you to IPOP.AI. We're a computer vision company, all right, and the computer vision market is huge, estimated to be almost 60 billion, or sorry, $86 billion by 2032. There's a good reason why. Unstructured business data represents 80 to 90% of business data out there, and, and computer vision is a great way to unlock it because a big chunk of this is in images and video. And that's what IPOP does. We help businesses of any size unlock their unstructured image data. Now there's another problem here, and that's the machine learning engineering shortage. There are only about 300,000 machine learning engineers globally. And yet, there's an estimated 1 million new machine learning engineering jobs that are going to be created over the next three years. IPOP helps your software developers create machine learning applications. So what is IPOP.ai? We are a self-service platform. We are there to help you build computer vision products, not just models, but the actual product. And we make it easy. We have a consumer level user interface with no and low code options. And we're perception AI. We are starting with computer vision and we're expanding from there. This is our leadership team. We have a deep bench of experience in building both products and companies. My previous startup company was acquired by Google in 2014. Andy Ballister, our chief product officer, is the co-founder of GoFundMe. Torsten Schultz, our chief technology officer, has had several exits. Two as a CTO, one of those to iHeartMedia and another to Yahoo. And Blythe Tal, our chief of AI, she is a rock star. She did her postdoc work at Caltech. She has worked for NVIDIA, Qualcomm, all doing machine learning and computer vision. Now, when we think of the computer vision market, when IPOP thinks of it, this is how we see it. There's three different categories. You have your outsourced machine learning teams. This is where a company pays another entity to create that product for them. You have your tools for machine learning engineers. These are tools that machine learning engineers use to build their products more effectively and more efficiently. And now you have this emerging category. And we really got to work on the name of this because what it's called now is Auto ML Computer Vision Platform. All right, but this category, there's some early players in this and we're one of them, is designed to make it easy for software developers to create these computer vision applications. We're one platform, but we can serve a wide range of markets. If you are in security or sports or recycling, if, you can use IPOP because if you have image data or video data, then we can help. This is some examples of what our customers are using IPOP for today. One of my favorites, San Diego State University is using computer vision to find archeological sites in the deserts of Jordan right here in town because you're using satellite imagery. We have Rapid Medical, which is confirming real-time delivery of medical samples from images. Cargo Shot, assessing the health and status of cargo in the warehouses of their customers. And UC San Diego is proving that computer vision can do a better job in assessing these types of laboratory samples than humans can. We are beginning with startup companies. This is our customer progression of how we're attacking the market. We're starting with startup companies because they are coming to us first. These are forward-leaning companies that understand technology and they are looking for their competitive edge. There also happens to be over 30,000 of them with recent funding. We then move to the software developers of the world. This is a channel for us to be a reseller opportunity because these are customers that are looking to serve their client base and computer vision is another tool that they can use. Right, from, 20 seconds. From there, we progress to the corporate world and advance to universities and then finally to the consumer creator. We raised $1.76 million last year and we're currently raising $2 million right now. And with that, thank you very much. Um, Can, can you go to your previous slide? Um, As you're going to tell me that down is up? Yeah. Or up is down? OK. Um, so last raise, what were the terms? What was the valuation? Last raise was a convertible note. It was uncapped with a 25% discount. And for $2 million, what, what's the target? We have just announced this $2 million raise. We don't have our lead yet. OK. Who has questions for Brad? OK. Let's start with you, Chetan. Could you uh, talk a bit about your uh, case studies in terms of what does it cost to you uh, to support like uh, rapid medical and what kind of revenue streams are you looking at? 
Yeah, so Rapid Medical, in that case, the when we turn them on for the revenue side, it's going to be $1,600 a month. And for that, we get about 75% gross margins. The one thing that we're doing different for them is our self-service model training uh, module is not available yet, so we're doing that for them ourselves. We're only doing that for case study customers. Yes, sir. Why are you raising so little money, and what is the exit plan? So $2 million is not the entirety of what we'll ultimately be raising. $2 million is what we're going to be raising to where we can demonstrate uh, product market fit. So if, well, that's going, leading us into a larger raise, either the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And I think your second question was exit. We're in this to be big. We are building a company to go public. Now, with that said, we know that acquisition is likely along the way. And of course, we'll entertain those options. But uh, it is our mission to take this company public. Misty. You mentioned that you had a variety of use cases and different types of customers. Who's actually clamoring for this product right now, and who's that target customer? It really is the startup companies, and their use cases, their market verticals are very broad. But if you look at what they need to do from the technology perspective, all of those modules are the same. So we're talking about companies that have a specific use case. They need some combination of a custom model combined with uh, other types of models. So we have a whole model library. We've gone deep on person, so you can imagine an individual object where they're also associating it with a person. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's who we're seeing as our earliest adopter. Uh, how long does it take you from the pilot uh, to the contract stage? Like, do you have any paying customers at the moment or are you still like piloting? Great question. That timeline has been shrinking dramatically because we we're working on our self-service training module. We're the first users of this. So we will ultimately have it where you can create a model in just a few days. Uh, from the t and I mean that from, from the time you start labeling your data set to when you can deploy the model. Uh, with the, and you had a second part to the question though. The conversion into the Oh, the conversion. Part. So we are, we are in contract negotiations with our first two paying customers right now. Okay, I gotta be honest, I'm confused. So you're going after startups, but you're basically saying the value prop is that you, there's not enough ML engineers. Startups don't have usually a labor shortage problem. It seems like that would be an enterprise. You're saying right now that you actually basically design to build because you don't, a lot of these modules aren't live yet. I'm confused at the value prop for the startups, to be honest. Like, I know you've talked about different use cases. I'm confused about the economics, if you could kind of help clarify that. Sure, yeah. So very few startup companies on a percentage basis actually have, unless they are the machine learning engineers themselves, they don't have a machine learning engineering team. They have to go recruit them or outsource it to another. So, and that's who we're seeing as the inbound traffic on this. Uh, the value prop for them is that they get to have you know, this, this machine learning capability to differentiate them. Uh, when it comes to the pricing, pricing, so what we're doing is we're pricing based off capacity. So this is, you know, if you need two dedicated servers because you need to run real time and you have some geographic distribution, then you're basically paying for that GPU time and we're guaranteeing that time for you. As you scale up, if you need additional servers, then your pricing scales with it. Yeah, go ahead. Oh on your training models, right? You showed in your case studies four pretty distinctly different uh, use cases, right? Right. How do you train? Do you train individually for each one or you have a common training methodology? Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. And so what you see, what you're going to see is uh, a combination. So we do have our model library and for some segment of the population that will be sufficient. But for most of these, they need at least some element of customization. And so they'll come in, they'll bring their own data set and we have a whole module where we can, we, can train a, we can train a custom model with an order of magnitude smaller data set than what you typically would find. That's part of what we do to make it easy. But then, uh, but then this model becomes theirs. So they will train it on the site and then it gets deployed for them. And all of the steps along the way from a technology perspective are the same. What the image is or, or the object is that they're trying to train for, that becomes different case by case. And it's, that's why you can see us being applicable for such a wide range of markets because we are agnostic to what they're trying to find. We are, uh, we are the step by which they can build these solutions themselves. And you mentioned two competitors in your space. Um, where are they in their life cycle and are they at revenue? Describe their business model briefly. Yeah, the two, the two that you saw there, so there's Nickel and Dragon Eye. So they're very, they also have a lot of other differences, but we just kind of forget that. They're very early. As far as I know, they're both pre-revenue. Um, Esther, you get the last question. It's very hard to grow as a platform strategy, so what's the beachhead, the vertical, what's the first use case? So the, the, 
The Beachhead Vertical for us really is the startup company that doesn't have their ML team that has that knows what they have that, that has call it a substantial amount of image or video data, and uh, and the market that they're in for us is not how we differentiate because that that we are agnostic for. Uh, it is what they have on the inside that uh, that we care about, and I didn't mean that to sound like uh, you know I know the inside is what really matters. That wasn't the message I was trying to make, but I do yeah. Okay, let's give Brad a big hand. Thank you for the laugh on that. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> okay, you can go to blue space, the next one. Um, while the judges are tabulating, how many want to vote for Brad? Please stand up. Okay, thank you, everyone. So next up we have Christine. Please welcome Christine. She is here from she is here from the Bay Area, Blue Space. Hi, uh, I'm Christine Moon, co-founder and president of BlueSpace.ai. Who's read the Three Body Problem or watched it on Netflix? Okay, well Blue Space comes out in the third part. Uh, it's named after a rocket ship that looks for the fourth dimension world. 4D is important because that's the set of sensors that we work with. So our tagline is explainable and verifiable AI for off-road autonomy. So remember the explainability and verifiability, it's very important as part of our offering. Oh, and I didn't get the clicker. Is this the clicker? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, down is... Oh. There we go. So my co-founder Joel and I uh, started this journey when we we're coming out of another AV, autonomous vehicle startup called Drive.ai. When it became part of Apple, we thought, hey, let's solve our own problem. Our problem was scalability. It's really hard to scale time and cost-wise. It's very expensive. It takes a damn long time. And it doesn't scale to new environments easily. So we are set out to do that. And our advisors are helping us along the way. So we're dual use, meaning we do defense and commercial. So we have advisors that help us based on their experience in both sectors. So our offering is powered by two models. One is Gen AI, which helps with scalability, adaptability. But we have in dark blue, blue space, verifiable AI. That's not something all autonomy players have. What it does is that it's independent of data, it checks for the correctness of the Gen AI. And that's where we are today, where we need to guarantee um, the um, explainability, performance boundaries, and scalability. Okay, so let's talk about that verifiability. We're math and physics based. It also is verifiable, as I said, and it works out of the box globally. We're not geofenced. Meaning our solution that works in San Francisco, works in Tokyo, works in um, Buenos Aires. And also it's very capital efficient autonomy software. And, and since we have Intel and Qualcomm exposure, uh, it operates on CPU alone. So when you say it's verifiable, it answers three things. Traceability, can you go back and tell us where it went wrong? Predictability, can you tell us how it will perform? And third, quantifiability. Can you quantify your confidence level of your software output? All these things are what's needed to work with defense, to work with heavy industries where uh, humans operate next to heavy machineries. And no one wants anyone to be in harm's way. So being able to explain that is very important. So we raised 12.5 million to date. We have 2 million in revenue. We're raising $20 million. So what do we do with that money? We worked with partners like Defense, as we said, with their unmanned ground systems, mining companies. We're also doing bus yard automation. So anything unstructured and off-road. Off-road is not paved. Unstructured means there's no lane markings to say, hey, computer, stay between these two clearly marked lanes. Um, HD mapping is something that autonomy requires to move an inch. We do not require all those things. So with our um, patents filed uh, and granted globally, what we want to do is scale. We're a software company, so when we have $20 million, our run rate uh, could be 18 months, or maybe we need to slow it down so it could be dragged on with slower hiring. 
30 seconds. Okay. Um, so we're targeting two markets, heavy industries and defense, but ADAS will come along. We do not think that's the first place we want to go. Automotive players are inevitably cheap, and they will nickel and dime you. Um, so, we're, uh, so some of the examples of off-road solution that scales to underground. This is a mining customer that we had. Also to adverse weathers, like the, uh, it's actually a video that's not playing, but it's okay. And um, on road. So this is Santa Clara. We've never been here before. Our software sees the world and spits out how it's moving and navigating that and scales to different platforms. Very good. Um, so you, you have raised $12 million. What, what was the valuation of the last round? Yeah, it was a safe, 20% discount. And what was the valuation cap? Uh, 120 million. Okay, and you're raising 20 million. That's right. Do you have a target? Target of? Target valuation. Oh, what the market sets. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard that it's a tough environment, but I think when you have a differentiated technology, you do have a way to really stand out there, and I believe that we have that. Okay, who has questions? Uh, Anand, please start with you. You said you have two million in revenue? Yes. Where does that come from? Can you quantify that a bit? And yeah. whether it's recurring or one time? Yeah, so 1.5 was last year, 0.5 this year. Um, yeah, it's customer engagement. I mean, for a deep tech company, based on my private, uh, prior experience, you don't make money until you're Series C. The fact that we have early traction as a deep tech company uh, is pretty encouraging. Um, we have uh, the mining customer who's extending the engagement. So I believe that what we really need to do is hire somebody who can market us so that we can be in other places where it can be a recurring. Can yeah. I do a follow-on? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll come. Go ahead. It, is what you're calling revenue from the mining company revenue or is it non-recurring uh, engineering expense? It's non-recurring engineering. So piloting, uh, we hope to make it into recurring because that's our business model to Thank license you. our software. Merci. If Blue Space is to fail, or if it were to fail, why? What would be the reason? I think it would be people who are closed-minded, thinking I have it all. Like, I have everything figured out, and I don't need anything else. Um, one of the things I didn't say is, who's our competitor? Mobileye, who is a vision-based approach, they've also come out and said, hey, we're doing 4D approach. 4D, not 3D. And they have their own sensor suite, but they're like Apple. They're integrated. They're not going to give it to a third party. We work with commercially off-the-shelf 4D sensors, and we allow people who are not mobilized to have a path towards redundant software that is robust, and that will be generalizable. Chetan. It's a very cool technology. I was yeah. curious about um, what kind of problems you might be encountering. Um, like, what's the, as you, you do you have like an index that tells you how good the software is getting over time? Yeah, well, the whole industry doesn't really have an, uh, a benchmarking, right? We don't know if Waymo is better than Cruise, right? That's the problem. But we do have metrics. False positive, false negative is a common metric used for perception. Or latency, software latency. How quickly did you respond? So our metrics, and we also have as part of autonomy, if you saw in our modular stack, APNT, Assured PNT. The uh, metric for that is tracker. How much error do you accumulate over distance traveled? And we've outperformed the industry of 1% of tracker. We're at 0 0.1, 0 0.3. And swap CY, size, weight, power, and compute, we're doing really, really well because we're a fraction of that price. Um, so we just have to win in one of the part of the vertical solutions that we offer, uh, whether it's ADAS, positioning, or AD. Uh, Susan. Okay, um, I'm just curious. So most of the time when you're going to win a contract, you're going to have a pretty large upfront NRE for integration. And then I don't know if that becomes something you can start to standardize. And then what does actually revenue look like on a reoccurring basis yeah. as you're envisioning it? Yeah, autonomy uh, does require integration. And that's a big commitment, and which oftentimes customers are not willing to make. So our positioning, perception, prediction is actually independent. It's a mountable device where we bring to the customer's site, and that's what we did with the mining company in the middle. It's a Nordic uh, mining OEM. We brought our stuff. They have their vehicle. We mount it, and, and out of the box, you can do the positioning without GPS, which is a hot topic right now. And we, perception uh, and real-time map generation can be done without reliance on wheel odometry. A lot of other companies rely on the vehicle information to give you that intel to get to that accurate positioning, which we do not need. Now, they see, they see that, and they'll say, ooh, I like your performance. Uh, I want to integrate. 
to my big haulage truck. That takes investment on their side and our side, and we'll do that. But retrofit is a very common thing for heavy industries where they're always upgrading some part of the vehicle. It's not common for automotive. You own a Corolla, you're gonna just keep it, right? Whereas these guys, these are like few million dollar vehicles, large ones, such that they're often checking out new sensing, new ways to make it more robust, safety and productivity wise. Essie. So um, I answer part of the question. Yeah, Essie, go ahead. So my usual question, what's the end game? What's the exit strategy? <laughs> Uh, thank God I'm the third one to go. I thought about it. Actually, as a Series A startup, you don't really think about exit already, so I'm thinking about growth. But uh, I think the, the paths are two. Independent, you grow, whether it's IPO or stay private and grow, grow, grow. Or it's not, you grow with another partner. And if that means our technology can see the light of the day faster, yeah, we're open. And then you had the last question. Yeah. You talked about using generative AI in the LLM. I didn't capture exactly how you're using it. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, so generative AI, as you know, it's another training model, learning-based. And what we're doing is using our data that we collected to train and be able to do off-road traversability. So it's really good with adaptability and scalability. The problem with that, and there's a company called Wave.ai out of UK that just raised a billion dollars, and their end-to-end gen AI model. Um, the problem with that is verifiability. How do you know? Data input could be tainted. Uh, they talk about data poisoning in the uh, defense world. So then the output is also tainted. So there, there is no way to check that, and that's where our verifiable AI plays an important role to check for the correctness of the Gen AI. That's what makes Blue Space really shine. And so we use both. A, are you doing Chris a custom too. model, or is it a standard LLM model? Okay. Uh, our own, custom, yeah. Okay, okay to be continued. Thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> okay, same drill. If you guys want to vote for Christine, please stand up. Okay, thank you everyone. Next up we have Fluffy Pets with AJ. Please welcome AJ. Yes. AJ is here from Seattle. He brought the reins. Thank you everyone for having me. My name is AJ Pepper, CEO and founder of Fluffy Pet Technologies. And I'm extremely grateful to be here in San Diego with all of you where I started my career bridging human and animal communication with Navy Special Warfare and building the first ever canine wearable augmented reality system. Before I get into Fluffy, I wanna give you a quick story. This is Jake. He's a five-year-old Labrador retriever. And last summer on one of the five days of sun Seattle got, his doggy daycare put kitty pools out in the yard for the dogs to play with. Now, nothing particularly out of the ordinary about that. Fast forward five hours, and Jake now finds himself at the vet for a multi-night stay suffering from dry drowning. Jake has inhaled and swallowed too much water while playing with the kitty pool. The cost beyond the trauma to Jake was a $3,000 vet bill paid for by the daycare, and then also the loss of that LTV of the customer of $20,000. Uh oh. The story of Jake is illustrative of a larger problem facing doggy daycares today. Because they rely so much on human monitoring and reporting, they simply can't see everything all the time, which means there's no ground source of truth about what's happening in every moment. And as a result of that, problem behaviors are too easily missed, as is in the story of Jake. Doggy daycares know this is a problem, and they're spending over a billion dollars every year trying to solve it, but it's a problem that can be solved for less than the cost of a visit to the vet. Allow me to introduce Fluffy. Doggy daycares can't see everything all the time, but Fluffy can. Through our proprietary computer vision system, we can identify and track each dog and their behavior in real time. For the doggy daycare, this means that we can fire off real-time notifications for problem behaviors, even before they happen, and we can aggregate all those insights 
and data into a unified dashboard, giving them a better way to manage the health, hygiene, and safety of the dogs under their care. For the pet parent, this means automated visit reports, something that they couldn't do prior having to rely on staff. These automated visit reports give key health and data information back to the pet parent, as well as really fun videos and pictures, because who doesn't love that with their dogs? And we can also tell you who your dog's best friend is, even though we'd probably like to think it's us. We might be pre-seed, but we have traction. We are working with a top enterprise customer right now that has over 200 locations, as well as working with local SMBs in the Seattle area. We've also validated pet parent interest to pay, looking at subscription fees of $30 a month. In our go-to-market, we're targeting 10% of the 21,000 care facilities currently in the United States and focusing our strategic approach with enterprise customers, those with 200 more locations, plus a regionalized approach for our go-to-market. And we're targeting $140 million in ARR with an $150 billion TAM. We're seeking to raise 750,000 pre-seed on a discounted safe to support the development of our product and computer vision algorithm, onboard new customers, and hire key engineering staff. Fluffy spun out of Conduit Venture Lab Studio, leveraging Amish Patel as CPO, Ed Parsons as CTO, and Amy Nichols as the former founder of Dogtopia, the biggest dog franchise, doggy daycare franchise in the States. If you love your pets, if you love your dog, or if you simply just don't want to hear another story about Jake again, join me in Fluffy's mission in changing the world in how we care, communicate, and love our pets. Thank you. Misty. Can you hear me? There you go. I love dogs um, way too much. But my question about Fluffy is, what is the urgent and pervasive problem here, and who's going to adopt this at scale? Yeah, so the urgent and pervasive problem is just around that message of humans can't see everything all the time, and if they were to staff a facility with enough humans to see everything all the time, it would put those doggy daycares out of business. And then that would also require that all those humans are putting all that data into a dashboard so that people can actually have access to it and understand the insights. So the impetus behind this, one, when you look at the enterprise customers, is really around staff augmentation, digital transformation, and helping to reduce that staff load, but getting even better data out of it. For the SMBs, it's really about identifying a problem before it ever becomes chronic, because if this problem happens too many times and they lose too many customers, well, now they're out of business. Okay. So Jake, for instance, that was a $3,000 charge for the daycare. So yeah, so there are issues that are happening around dog bites, aggressive events, and things of that nature. Uh, dogs not getting enough water. And so it is happening, and a lot of times we don't hear about it because there's no one reporting on it. So there's actually two aspects to Fluffy, which is one, the more altruistic approach, which is identifying what's going on so we can share it with pet parents. The other part as you think about this is a welfare aspect and actually making sure that there's compliance in those facilities to make sure these dogs are getting the care they want. They can't advocate for themselves. And so while it is happening and we have it on video of these things happening, they're not, they don't have to report on it, which is what me as a dog lover want to make sure that this care is being met to a high level. Okay, other, other questions? What have you created in the solution that um, <clears throat> not off the shelf or difficult to replicate? Yeah, great question. So this is what we like to call the golden retriever problem. So if you get 10 golden retrievers on the stage, then I'm guessing for those of you that aren't dog lovers, we probably have a very difficult time identifying each one as they moved around the stage. And that can be a very difficult challenge within the computer vision space because now you've got bounding boxes that are going to occlude one another and go over one another. And so our big technical moat is being able to have that unique ID associated with each dog and have that unique ID persist across the day, across the days, months, and years that that dog is part of the facility. So that's a big part of it, which is that re-identification part of our computer vision module. I can probably ask the question for you. Is it the exit strategy one? Oh. 
I've heard that before. <laughs> this is not my first judging panel. <laughs> but I always ask that question. No, my question for you is, what would prevent, you know, like having a little camera or a little tag on a dog and sort of, to, to your point, Misty, taking care of like 90% of the, the insurance-related or safety-related problems you're describing, like the substitution, basically. So what would having a, an air tag, for instance, on a dog be as a substitute for this? Okay, so one thing is an issue is most dog day care facilities don't have hardware on their dogs because it becomes a choking risk, which now introduces now another liability. So a lot of these places won't allow any hardware to be worn, which is why computer vision makes so much sense because it doesn't require hardware on the dog. It's completely autonomous of the staff, the dogs, there's no interaction with it, and we can pump all that to a database. And there's a lot of things that the tag can't see. The tag is not gonna be able to determine play. Is it grappling? Is it nipping? Is it biting? Is it wrestling? Is it boxing? The tag's not gonna be able to detect that. And so I do foresee a, an area, especially as we go into the B2C space, where you could have a tag, something like Phi Collar, Whistle back in the day, Tractive, where you can compare, you can pair that with computer vision and it becomes a more robust solution. But for right now, the lowest common denominator is no hardware in the facility because that introduces risk, and that's the last thing we wanna do. How long till you have a commercial product that you can sell, you know, the algorithm working, everything working the way you want with the dashboards and everything? That October. Needs for October 24? Yes, sir. With the race or without the race? With the race. With the race. Okay, thank you. Partial race. Adrian? Sorry, am I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you talk about traction? I missed that if you did. Traction? Yeah. Yeah, we have an enterprise level customer with 200 locations that we're piloting right now, and then multiple SMBs in Seattle. Yep. Yeah, just a reminder he's pre seed. Yeah. Um, other pre questions? Pre seed yes. with traction. You all you noted. Uh, you also mentioned that you are going to be targeting the daycares. What's your growth strategy? How do you go to market? Yeah, so the go-to-market strategy right now is pretty interesting. There are a number of bigger players in the market that have over 200 locations. So Camp Bow Wow, Doctopia, PetSmart. These are our primary focus because landing those give us 800 plus locations to target over the next couple of years. And then we're also growing that go-to-market uh, that go to market muscle and trying to generate those smaller SMBs, which is something we're working on now. So a lot of the work I do is working with those SMBs today, understanding the value prop, understanding what makes this most impactful for them. And then the plan is as we're loading up on the enterprise side is to start that demand gen for the SMBs, get it in our backlog so that when we are ready to turn this on, it's not reaching out from scratch. We've established a relationship and we can push it to market. Let's give a big hand to AJ. Okay, we'll do the same drill. Uh, if you want to vote for AJ, please stand up. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Next up, we have Kate, um, Cooler Heads, founder CEO of Cooler Heads. Kate hails from Sunny San Diego. Um, down this up. Yes, you can clap. On. Cancer nonprofits raise money, showing you pictures of bald people to emphasize how debilitating cancer treatment is. And so it really shouldn't be a surprise that 8% of chemo patients actually refuse treatment over fear of hair loss. And if you think about it, that makes sense because no one wants to be pitied or seen as sick. And so why do only 20% of infusion centers in the US offer scalp cooling, the therapy that allows chemotherapy patients to keep their hair? Fundamentally, it's because the therapy to date has doubled the amount of time patients are in the infusion center at an opportunity cost of $16,000 per missed infusion. It simply doesn't make sense. And so when I set out to solve this problem, I realized I had to solve it for providers if I wanted to expand access for patients. And that's what we've done with AMA that we launched in late 22, the first portable, affordable, scalable solution for scalp cooling that gets the patients out of the infusion chair so we are not changing patient workflows. 
We did a million dollars in revenue our first year on the market, and I am pleased to say we are now at 56 infusion centers at 25 health systems across the United States. We'll do two and a half million dollars in revenue this year, and this is a billion dollar market for just scalp cooling in the US that's growing. Think of Kate Middleton, cancer rates are going up, chemotherapy rates are going up, and with, re with increased reimbursement, this is now financially within reach for most chemo patients. We make money by selling the machine, the cap system, and warranties to the healthcare system. And what's important to note is that every patient needs their own cap. So this is very much a razor, razor blade business. You can see we already have excellent margins on our hardware, and so we structured our business with reimbursement at $2,000 to incentivize infusion centers to encourage patients to use it. So you can think of it in this very simple way. In the first year that an infusion center brings in AMA, we make $42,000, they make $36,000, so it's a win for us, the infusion center, and most importantly, the patient. And, oh, that's kind of weird, sorry about that. Well, I'm really proud of our customer list. And you can see that we are now at major, we are at major academic centers, large hospital networks, community health centers, VAs, and private practices. And each of those green stars, please ignore the green block, uh, denotes an account that didn't offer scalp cooling before we made it financially feasible for them to do so. We are solving for that 80% of infusion centers that haven't done this in the past. And that's why we're winning. We have deep IP in the unique geometry of our capping system and the attributes of the machine that fundamentally make it portable. We are one of three players in this market in the United States. And you can see with our superior outcomes and our rapidly growing business, we're just commercially gonna be really hard to catch. And we have the right team to do this. I'm a cancer survivor, but I'm also a Stanford MBA and serial tech entrepreneur Courtney, who leads our sales team, cut her teeth at Stryker, and her last company exited for more than $330 million. Nick is an electrical engineer that's been doing med devices his entire career. So we're currently raising a 10 million Series A to scale. We're going to hit profitability in 2026 at about $18 million in revenue, and by 2028, we're at $60 million a year, treating 37,000 patients, which is roughly 7% of all cancer patients that would benefit from, from scalp cooling, or you can think about it as 19% of breast cancer patients. We're also releasing the second version of AMA late next year that will, even, that will further improve outcomes. I look forward to talking to you in the room that are actively investing or who can make introductions to healthcare customers. Thank you. Thank you. These slides look really weird, guys. Sorry, they look cleaner on my machine. Number one, congratulations on beating cancer and your hair looks fabulous. Um, who does not want this to exist? So today, the people who haven't wanted this to exist are the infusion center nurses that were stuck providing this therapy. So we're unique in that we teach patients to be self-sufficient and to onboard themselves. So what you can see actually in those 20% of infusion centers that offer our competitors, a lot of times the nurses talk patients out of it. They're like, you know, it only kind of works, or it's really expensive, and you know, a lot of people think it's uncomfortable. So there's actually a lot of kind of discouragement provided to patients because the nurses don't want to deal with it. By us having a product that's patient administered, portable, we're not changing workflows, we now have patients that are coming to us, like a patient at Providence uh, who told, or had a clinical earlier this week, the nurses just say great things about you guys. Angela. Um, okay, I have two questions, sorry. Um, one, when you say like doesn't interrupt workflows, are patients doing this in the infusion centers alongside in a separate room? Does it run the length of the treatment? Like, so as long as they're in chemo, they're doing the scalp cooling. And then the last one, as you mentioned, you're gonna have something that's gonna even provide more enhancements. I'm curious what that is. Sure, so uh, for scalp cooling to be effective, you, you bring your scalp temperature down to 65 degrees before, during, but here's the kicker, for two to three hours following chemotherapy. So you start it concurrently with the pre-meds, which are like the steroids and the anti-nausea meds that they give to chemo patients so they don't just keel over when they start the main event. But for us, for the post-chemo cooling, the infusion center decides where the patients do that. So the patients get out of the chair, 
they're in the waiting room, they're in the atrium, they're going to get a cup of coffee, they're doing it someplace else, so they're sitting down another patient. Uh, on, the, on the go to market, um, one, just with this capital component of the sale, how are you planning to scale your sales team? And why are you not in California? <laughs> I was really hoping, oh sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, we have a really marquee customer uh, that we hope to announce by the end of this uh, quarter in California. But yeah, we have customers in Iowa and Oklahoma, uh, but we don't have customers in California yet. So it has been a long sales cycle. One of our superpowers is actually the reason why we're now at 25 health systems. I mean, we just landed Baptist MD Anderson was our 25th account, is we're one of our superpowers is we're able to use foundation funding for the capital equipment, so we're not going through the back process um, at the health system. So you mentioned that there are two more companies that are doing similar things, uh, so it's a pretty tight competition on a very focused market. How do you plan to win the competition, uh, whether it's a product or a marketing strategy? So how do you look at this? So all those green stars shows why we're winning. So the legacy systems, you know, I was talking about before, during, and for several hours after, the legacy systems require the patients to sit there for two hours following treatment, two to three hours following treatment. So that means the infusion center is losing $16,000 every time a patient scalp cools, because that's one less patient that they can bring in. That's why, you know, Providence um, throughout hasn't offered scalp cooling before, which they have five million lives that are insured throughout just the Providence network. And so they haven't offered it because it was simply too expensive for their oncology services line to bring in. So we're the fast follower, the highly differentiated company. Uh, the two legacy players were founded in Europe in the late 90s, early aughts. They bring kind of a European single payer healthcare mindset to the American market. They were the first here in 2016, 2017. So again, they developed traction at roughly 20% of infusion centers. But we're changing how this therapy is done, uh, and we're already winning. For the health systems that you're already installed in, what percent of the infusion patients are adopting the treatment, and how do you increase utilization? Great, great question. So we are currently, so we're a 14-person team, and so we do not have anybody focused on utilization yet. And so we actually have phenomenal patient growth with what we're calling our Pathfinder doctor. So like what we see is the majority of patients that are, pers that are using AMA are from the medical oncologists that were part of bringing in the technology. So they're really bought in. They're starting to see excellent outcomes. So they're starting to talk to more and more patients. Part of our series A raise is not only to add sales team, but to add utilization team. Because we know who the prescribing doctors are. We also know who their colleagues are that are seeing the similar patient population. So there's a lot of hands-on work to do because a lot of oncologists to this point, they didn't go to med school when scalp cooling was a thing. It's only been at 20% of infusion centers. But like we, we have the advantage of having our first publication coming out of ASCO uh, next week really showing efficacy and the value of a patient-administered portable system. Definitely don't want to take you off of your awesome trajectory, uh, but what are the other use cases? And to add on to Susan's question about the vision, like what's coming next? So I view AMA as our Trojan horse into oncology cancer care. So when I was a patient, what I really identified is that there's a huge disconnect between them treating your disease, but when it comes to side effect management, you're really on your own. So we're proving with scalp cooling by making symptom management accretive to healthcare systems, you can then make those uh, services accessible to patients. So we're actually gonna be moving into the digital healthcare products that we can also use these remote billing codes to provide a, to provide a revenue stream to infusion centers rather than focusing in on scalp cooling. Like we've had people approach us to license the tech for like migraines and other things. I wanna solve cancer side effect management problem because that's something that I really felt when I was going through chemo, then surgery, then radiation, and years and years of being on tamoxifen. Let's give Kate a big hand. Okay, while the judges are tabulating, who wants to vote for Kate? One, two. Thank you, everyone. 
So next up, we have Deepak. He runs Prof Gem, bringing AI and education to the table. Let's give Deepak a big hand. <laughs> Deepak is from, from the Bay Area. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Deepak from Professor Jim. At Professor Jim, we believe incredible learning experiences are possible using AI technology. And I'll tell you more. Uh, my background is that I'm an inventor. I've been an inventor on 250 patents. A dozen of them I use in every smartphone. My previous startup was acquired by DoorDash. So uh, the way this started, oops. So the way this started was during the pandemic. And that was when uh, my five-year-old daughter's school decided she needed to sit in front of Zoom seven hours a day and learn. And you can tell that she's not sitting in front of her computer and learning on Zoom. She's doing something else. And so uh, I got involved. And I actually sat through some of her classes to find out why she was getting so bored. And it was pretty clear. Uh, the classes were really boring. Uh, and I was like, there must be a better way of creating learning content uh, uh, and, and uh, teaching through uh, Zoom. And so I, was, uh, I came up with uh, some concepts related to AI and using AI for creating learning content. And that was 2020, before uh, ChatGPT came out. And so we filed a lot of basic patents on using AI for creating educational content. And a good bit of it has been granted already. So we've got pretty fundamental patterns in the space. So what we do, uh, the problem we are solving essentially is with all these LLMs, uh, they work only some of the time. <laughs> if you give a LLM a math problem, it works two out of three times. And when you're teaching, you can't afford to be wrong. And that's the biggest problem right now with using all these LLMs for creating learning content. And we've solved it. Uh, using uh, three methods. The first method is we find if we give a textbook as input to an AI, it gives a lot fewer errors. It's almost perfect. And we've got basic patterns on taking a textbook as input and converting it into video. And we work with several of the world's largest textbook publishers, and we have paid contracts with them. These include College Board, Cengage, which is the second biggest textbook publisher out there. We also work with Taylor Francis, uh, and. Imagine Learning, a whole bunch of other textbook publishers. The other way we get uh, more accurate learning content is we use uh, a learning-focused LLM we built in-house, and that gives a lot better quality in terms of output. So I'm going to play this uh, learning video. This was a sample learning video, which was auto-generated using our AI. But we use these AI avatars for teaching. And I can create an AI avatar of anyone with 10 minutes of video from them, which looks like them and sounds like them. And uh, we, can, we can look at it together. Uh, the main benefit of uh, creating learning content automatically like this is we see a 3x to 15x improvement in content creation efficiency. So it's almost like every content creator becomes you know, turbocharged. Uh, if they can produce 10x output, using AI automatically, that's incredible. We find student engagement goes up quite a bit as well. And this is work we've done with clients where they've done tests and got these numbers. So in terms of where we are right now, believe it or not, we are profitable this quarter. And we will be moving forward also. It's a pretty high margin business. Uh, we have a $0.6 million contract with a company called Learning Ally, which is all recurring revenue. We also have $186,000 of a contract with Houston School District. Uh, we also have contracts with a whole bunch of others, which all add up. And our goal is every quarter, we got to do three of these expansion type deals, these bigger size deals. Uh, people first start off with a smaller contract, check us out, and then go to the bigger one. And in the last six months, we haven't had a single customer who's not scaled up to a bigger size contract yet. And we haven't lost a single customer yet in the last six months since we launched. 30 seconds. Um, so uh, in terms of why we are better, we are the only ones who can auto-generate learning content at scale with good quality. We've won a number of awards. And uh, the team, a good bit of it is in India. And it helps. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why we can be profitable so quickly. 
my co-founders, one of them was at Microsoft. Maria was my other co-founder. She was at Techstars with me in my previous company. Uh, we decided to start this together. And uh, raising money at a 15 million safe, uh, uh, we targeted raising a million. 70% of it is taken already. Uh, and uh, can you play the video? Uh, we, we, we don't have time. We, otherwise, we'll, we'll take time from Q&A. So um, I'll, I'll start with a couple of questions. Deepak, you did not talk about yourself. Can you talk about yourself? You know, what, what um, the past company you exited, number of patents you have, and so on? So uh, yeah, I just made the, I, I mentioned a bit of it at the introduction. Uh, my last company was uh, acquired by DoorDash, and I got tired of cooking my dinner at home, started building a robot which cooked my dinner. That company is called Chowbotics. Uh, and now there's like 20 companies all doing food making robots. Uh, but uh, we, we won the market there. And uh, the acquisition with DoorDash went well. And a lot of those investors uh, reinvested in this company. Uh, so uh, it just needs a few phone calls uh, if the last company is successful and people just put money in. OK, Zamir. Now, t talk to us about your customer. You mentioned the school districts. And typically, you know, the, uh, it's a tender procedure. I mean, you, you can't just uh, go and sell stuff to them. And it's a very long sales cycle. So how do you tackle that? So we have two uh, types of customers. One of them is the publishers and curriculum developers. These are companies like College Board and uh, Cengage and the textbook publishers. Those are very easy to sell in uh, because we've got the patents on taking the textbooks and converting them to video. They can't work with anyone else. Uh, and uh, so that's a pretty simple sale. We just go in, they, they, do, they sign up for a first contract, which is a smaller size one, less than $5,000. Within about a month, we uh, show them some content and then they sign up for a bigger one, right? With educational institutions, I believe in five years time, Every single university which teaches online will use uh, these avatars for teaching. Uh, we have Carnegie Mellon as a customer, and then the Indian Institute of Management Bangalore is a customer as well. With all these universities, getting a professor to come to get a video shoot is a real hassle. Professors like to do research. They don't like going to a studio and talking in front of a camera for 10 hours. And so with Carnegie Mellon, it takes them nine months to develop one course. With our technology, uh, once the avatar is made, you don't have to beg the professor to come in for a video shoot anymore. So it's less than a month. Um, yes, Susan, go ahead. Sorry. So talk to me about the raise, because it looks like you're already profitable. This is not a lot of money. Um, it looks like you're starting to get towards that inflection point. What's driving this number, and what are you supposed to achieve with that number? Yeah, so with the raise, uh, I have right now the only person doing sales is one quarter of me. Uh, and sales, I'm building out the sales team in the US. I have two salespeople I'm hiring. One of them has already accepted the offer. This person uh, uh, has a Rolodex of more than 3,000 top uh, uh, educational institutions, and she knows everyone. So she's uh, already signed up to be a VP of sales. Uh, one of uh, the pay, uh, the money uh, is partly for her. Uh, the second one, I need to hire one more salesperson as well, and the rest is for a rainy day. <laughs> Because you always spend more than you think you can. Yes, so the, and the goal is to stay profitable and build the company profitably and scale as much as we can profitably. So I may have missed this, but uh, when you were going through your pitch, you mentioned that the uh, in the beginning it was because your daughter was bored and online learning is boring. And then you were talking about efficient content creation. And then you were talking about an increase in 30% learning out outcomes. What's the problem that you're solving and who are you solving it for? I'm, I'm not quite clear on that. So if you look at that video, which I was going to show you, you'll, you'll realize. Uh, because it just makes learning so much better. Summarize so that, it for us. Uh, OK, so that video I was going to play. Uh, describes uh, history from 536 AD. Uh, and we actually recreated scenes from history from 2,000 years back using AI. So imagine a child is uh, learning about the Civil War. You can actually recreate scenes from the Civil War using AI and have, an, uh, have maybe uh, Abe Lincoln, an avatar of Abe Lincoln, teach it. It's a lot more engaging because you have Abe Lincoln teaching about the Civil War. You have scenes from the Civil War. And the other thing with learning is people remember only 20% of what they learn after a week if it's just plain video. 
But if you make it interactive content where the student actually engages with the video, they remember 70% of what they learn. So is it, the, is it the entertainment? Is it the increased learning outcomes? Is it the efficient, like what is it's, the? It's increased learning outcomes through a combination of uh, making it uh, interesting and using better pedagogy, which is more interactive and not just plain boring video. If you have kids with ADHD, you'll understand this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have uh, time for one more question. One last question. Yes. 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 Can you share your growth rate in terms of revenue? So uh, we launched in uh, December. Uh, in Q1, uh, compared to Q1, Q2 was 4x in terms of revenue. And uh, Q2 was profitable. Q3, uh, because of the rec recurring revenue kicking in, should stay profitable uh, or very close to profitable. Uh, I am hiring some costly salespeople. Uh, uh, but uh, the goal, at least my last company, we were doubling our revenue every quarter. This, this time, I'm hoping we can do better. OK. Let's give a big hand to Deepak. <laughs> we'll do the same drill. How many of you want to vote for Deepak? Thank you, everyone. So we have one more to go. Um, Meredith Perry, founder and CEO of Elimine Technologies. Uh, there is one uh, caveat. Any press people here? Um, OK, so let, let's think offline. Um, Meredith agreed to talk about a product she's launching in a, in a couple of weeks. So can, can I please ask you to not take pictures and tweet her slides and so on? Can we do that? OK, she'll show you the device in return. So Meredith. So down is up. Yes. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Perry, co-founder and CEO of Elamind, a company developing next generation wearable neurotechnology for health and wellness. So let's talk about healthcare in 2024. Today, healthcare is reactive. It's slow. It's not personalized. It's, it's based on old technology. It lags far behind the technology that we have today, and it's largely dependent on pharmaceuticals. And while pharmaceuticals can be effective, we also know that they have side effects and, um, and don't really work sometimes in the way that we want them to. So we think that we have a better way. Who is we? My team is comprised of world-renowned neuroscientists, biologists, and geneticists. My co-founder, Dr. Ed Boyden, is the lead neuroscience professor at MIT. And over the last four and a half years, we have been developing a way to mimic the effects of specific pharmaceuticals using non-invasive stimulation. And we call this electric medicine. With electric medicine, which we are at the forefront, we have a wearable device that can read the brain and intercept it in real time. We can guide the brain through neurostimulation. And when we do this, we've seen that we can change behavior, so like a drug, but much smarter and without the side effects. So our discovery is my co-founder's algorithm uh, that allows us to compute what's called the phase of a biological wave in real time and stimulate about 100 times faster than human reaction time, which enables precise and predictable neuromodulation. In English, that means that we can change the brain from the outside in a way that is predictable. And when we can change the brain, we've seen that we can change behavior. So there's a number of different applications for this technology, ranging from controlling tremor to augmenting anesthesia to boosting memories and inducing sleep and uh, a whole bunch of other things. To date, we've done a number of different trials, both clinical trials and uh, pilot studies over the last five plus years, both internally and with other universities that show in our studies that we can suppress tremor for people with essential tremor. We can help people fall asleep much faster. When we combine our technology with anesthesia, we can enhance the level of sedation and uh, a recent study with one of our colleagues showed that we can boost memory formation. But 
Our Tesla Roadster, and to prove ourselves in the market, is focused on sleep. And it's with the headband that I have on my head right now. We've developed a headband that can help people fall asleep significantly faster without pharmaceuticals. With Elamind, you can start and restart sleep on demand. In clinical studies, we've shown that 76% of participants fell asleep faster with Elamind. This has been clinically tested over 876 nights of sleep and 96 naps in a randomized controlled trial that we did uh, we showed that the people that improved, which was 76% of subjects, fell asleep an average of 48% faster with the ceiling improvement of 74% faster. This is comparable to the leading sleep drugs. So uh, how does this work? The brain is an electrical, electrical, uh, electrochemical organ, and we can measure brainwave activity on the outside of the brain using something called an EEG. The more awake that the... Uh, that we are, the higher the frequency are brain waves, and the sleeper, sleepier we are, the lower the frequency are brain waves. You can think about our technology kind of like noise cancellation for the brain. We read the brain and we can stimulate the brain and interfere with the high frequency alpha waves that are associated with wakefulness. And when we do this, we see that people fall asleep much faster. So our first product, which is a consumer wellness product, will have a, a number of different features, including uh, the ability to accelerate sleep onset, which is go to sleep faster. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> we're waking you up in the sleep presentation. Um, help you fall back to sleep faster if you wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, we have, um, we, we can do real-time sleep, sleep staging and provides, provide you with all of your data and trends. And this is as accurate as a $30,000 hospital grade uh, polysomnogram. Um, and we're going to be rolling out a feature later this year, which is called Sleep Quality Boost, where we stimulate the brain during deep sleep to lengthen the amount of time spent in deep sleep, which is associated with better sleep quality, um, among other things. Oh, 30 seconds. Oopsies. Okay, we've got a lot of really great investors. Um, uh, we have got thousands on our wait list already, even though we haven't announced the product. Uh, we've done four clinical trials, one clinical study. We have three publications, actually four as of yesterday. We have seven patents, three issued, three pending. We expect to get seven million in our first year if all of you guys buy it and tell your friends. Um, we're raising a 10 million Series A. You should sign up for our beta. Uh, which is coming out in just a couple of weeks using this QR code. We're looking for distribution and partnership opportunities, and you can email me if you can read my email on the screen. Thanks. <laughs> Great presentation. I was completely excited about all the applications and all the must-have use cases until you landed on this is a sleep wellness device, which is a nice-to-have. And so why pick a nice to have when you could have a must have? Sleep is an enormous market. While there are, uh, while there's a huge need for things like, actually, I shouldn't say a huge need. There is a need, there's a strong need for something like a tremor suppressor. Uh, there's only a small fraction of the market that has tremor. Literally everybody sleeps and 68% of the United States wants something that can help them fall asleep faster and improve their sleep. So it's something that every single person can have regardless of whether or not you have a sleep problem. So sleeping medications, while obviously not optimal, are paid for by, by, by most insurance. This is a consumer product. Um, how do you think about the impact of that on your overall market size, and do you intend to get this covered by insurance? No, this is a general wellness product. It's not going, it's, it's FDA exempt. We are interested in getting FDA approved later, but that doesn't actually guarantee that we would get an insurance code, so we're not banking on that. Um, uh, this product is going to be competitively priced alongside all other wearables, so uh, we're talking $349. That's less than a dollar a day to get what we hope will be the best sleep of your life, and we think that this is something that people will buy. Could you talk about uh, competition? Like, there must be other companies also attacking the same problem. Yes, um, there are uh, a few different companies that are trying to help people fall asleep faster. Well, actually, uh, in terms of like the, the head wearable space, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, yeah, there's a, a few different companies that are trying to attack this. Most of them are um, using uh, like guided meditation or cognitive behavioral therapy or um, approaches, oops, sorry, uh, approaches like that. There's only one other company that is using stimulation to help you fall asleep. Um, and they use electrical stimulation. 
Uh, we don't think that this is going to be successful in the market. People aren't really interested in electrically stimulating the brain every single night to go to sleep. We use acoustic stimulation. That's just sound. It's very light. It's very safe. And there are no negative side effects. There are some negative side effects with electrical stimulation. What does it cost to produce the wearable? And then what are you selling it for? I don't know if we want to say that publicly, <laughs> um, but uh, significantly less than what, we're, uh, what we'll be selling it for. How, um, once you stimulate the brain to a different behavior pattern, how long does it stay before it goes back to its normal state? Well, uh, that's a better question for our head of research who's actually done the, uh, it's called an ERP study that actually measures the impact of every single pulse that we send. Um, uh, so you can talk to him. Um, but what we see is that people fall asleep much faster um, once we, once we uh, do the stimulation, and then they're naturally in sleep. So we're not like continue, we're not keeping them asleep throughout the night. They just, you know, go through their natural sleep process after that. There's no hangover effect of the stimulation. I have a question about the form factor. I mean, uh, it probably would be, you know, weird for me to wear something uh, during the night because, you know, I, I, I turn and I've seen a couple other startups do devices that you can actually sit next to your head and then, you know, s send you some waves and then you calm you down, etc. So do you believe that this form factor, the, the wearable, is, is the, the best out there? What are you... Um, it's safe. actually the only way that we can do this. Uh, we have to touch the brain in order for this to work because we have to read the brain signals in real time to do it. We can't even offload the computation to a phone because the latency is too large to be able to affect the brain. This is real time. Everything is done on the device itself. We have gone through seven different iterations of this prototype to make sure that every single person in every sleeping position will be comfortable. Um, I am a side sleeper and a stomach sleeper, and I am the biggest critic of this product, and it is very comfortable. I'm happy to have you try it afterwards. Okay, last question. Go to market strategy, uh, going after consumers. What are you, what are you gonna start with? Uh, and and are you, do you have any com commercial or retail partners already lined up? Uh, no commercial or retail partners, but there are a few different uh, distribution partners online that are interested in selling this product that we're working through those deals. We are going to start as direct-to-consumer, but in the background, I'm working on uh, a bunch of B2B deals as well, selling these to potentially hospitals and operating rooms um, and uh, rehab centers and things like that. Okay, Let, let's give Meredith a big hand. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to announce... Uh, silver, gold, platinum, and then your voting, People's Choice Awards. So the silver award goes to Deepak Sekar, Prof. Jim. Let's, let's give Deepak a big hand. Deepak, we have been working night and day but the trophy takes its own time. We, we tried to get AI-based trophy, it doesn't work. So we have to mail the trophies to everyone, okay? Um, the gold award goes to, where is Christine? Christine is not here? Maybe we should give it to somebody else. <laughs> the gold award goes to Blue Space AI, Christine Moon. She's from the Bay Area. She probably um, is on the way to the airport. Um, the Platinum Award goes to Kate. Yeah, Cooler Heads, um, Kate Dilligan. Uh, Kate, your presentation was awesome. And uh, you, you touched everybody. In, in ways that is uh, not easy to do. So thank you. And the People Choice Award goes to Meredith Elimine Technologies. Thank you everyone.